be Dr. Nora Abul Hassan, who um, is currently the Vice President of Genomic Health at 23andMe. She also has an Associate Professor position on the other side of the country um, at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, and Dr. Abul Hassan uh, came to us across the border. She had done her undergraduate and uh, master's work at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, um, prior to going across the border and never turning back afterwards. Um, at uh, Mount Sinai, did her medical degree, her PhD, her medical residency, um, and then her medical genetics residency uh, prior to being a faculty there where she headed, she was the director of their uh, genomic medicine clinic. Um, she spent a brief bit of time with uh, Regeneron and then came back to academia. And now she sort of has her foot in both, in both worlds, which I think is what we'll hear a little bit about today. Um, needless to say, there are uh, endless awards, um, numerous papers, grants, um, all in support of a very strong expert whom we're gonna hear from today. Um, so again, thank you very much. I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to hand the floor over to Nora to go from here. Thank you so much. And I just want to check if I walk away. Yes, you can still hear me. Okay, good. Because I probably won't stay still. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. It's my first time visiting uh, NIH campus, and um, thank you so much to Dr. Hanchard for hosting my visit and for everyone I've met with um, earlier today for such a lovely welcome and really exciting conversations with all of you. I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk today about population genomic screening and what, is, what that is, what that means, and how it relates to preventive health. <laughs> Uh, and uh, as you heard, I am currently employed by 23andMe. Uh, I also serve as a scientific advisory board member for Alelica, a PRS company. Uh, and I have a part-time faculty position at Mount Sinai where I spent the majority of my academic career. And you're going to hear a lot about things that I care about deeply from my academic world and in the latter part of the talk, what we're working on on the 23andMe side to really bring us closer to genomic medicine and how it can inform prevention. So I'll talk about three major topics today, population genomic screening, defining that, thinking about what, it, what role it plays today in uh, bringing genetics into healthcare more broadly, how we have thought about expanding the reach of genomic medicine to increasingly diverse populations, and again, uh, scaling genomic screening through consumer genetics in my new role, relatively new role, at 23andMe. So population genomic screening. Uh oh, I have to not knock into that. Um, what do we mean by genomic screening in general? Well, many of you, this is NHGRI, you're very familiar with genetic testing and its typical applications in the diagnostic space, which have been used for decades uh, very successfully to try to understand the genetic etiology of rare diseases, of cancer conditions, et cetera. But when we talk about um, genetic screening, it's really going beyond this typical diagnostic application and thinking about how screening can be used to predict disease, to potentially prevent disease, and finally to personalize treatment across someone's lifetime, and really how it has an impact across all stages of life. And I really like to think about this as something that is used for every person at every stage of life in every medical specialty, whether you're sick or whether you're healthy. And I've always thought of this as taking a genome-first approach. So rather than starting with a phenotype um, at the right, your right side of the screen, if you start with a phenotype, someone's come to medical attention because they have some clinical signs or symptoms of a disease, they have a family history, they have a reason to get a genetic test. But when you flip this the other way and you start with a genotype, this can help you understand now a lot more about what that genotype has to offer in terms of our understanding of um, phenotypic spectrum of disease, penetrance, whether someone with a particular genotype is likely to go on and manifest signs and symptoms of a disease or not, uh, severity, and the prevalence of underlying genetic conditions, whether they've been diagnosed or not in a population. And when you translate that to population genomic screening, the real power of genomics becomes in risk prediction and how you can leverage that information as early as possible to prevent those phenotypes from ever manifesting and causing morbidity and mortality. 
So I want to give an example from some of the earliest work that I did in this space, and this was from the time that I was at Regeneron, and the Regeneron Genetic Center was just starting to sequence tens of thousands of exomes, now they're in the hundreds of thousands. And we took a look just to see in a biobank, which was uh, part of the Geisinger Health System in rural Pennsylvania, uh, under, uh, among individuals who had exome sequence data that was linked to electronic health records, what happened if you just took a look for known disease-associated variants? Uh, and in this case, we were looking at familial hypercholesterolemia, a condition that's linked to earlier onset of heart disease, of stroke, uh, very high levels of cholesterol. And we looked for pathogenic or disease-causing variants in three genes known to be associated with this disorder, LDLR, ApoB, PCSK9 in an unselected patient population through this biobank uh, effort. And what we were able to do was understand the genotypic prevalence of FH, and I'll get back to that in a second. When you looked at individuals who had pathogenic variants in these genes, we were able to see that they did indeed have higher LDL levels in their medical records, and you could see that there were differences uh, by genotype uh, according to the different genes that we found people with. And finally, that individuals with this genotype prevalence of FH were also at increased risk for not only general coronary artery disease, but also earlier onset CAD, and you could start to see differences again across genotypes. So this was really one of the first times that anyone had undertaken a geno genome first or genomic screening approach in a biobank that was linked to medical records, and we learned some very key findings that since then, this was in 2016, since then these have been replicated time and time again, multiple diseases, multiple biobanks, multiple different populations. And some of those learnings I'm highlighting here, one is that genetic conditions in the general population, or at least the genotypes linked to genetic conditions, are far more prevalent than we ever imagined. In this case, the prevalence that we found for genotype positive FH was around one in 200, and what was thought to be the prevalence prior to the study was one in 400. We've seen similar uh, experiences with things like BRCA1 and 2, where the true population prevalence of having a pathogenic variant in a known disease gene is probably double previous estimates, which were biased basically because of the clinical ascertainment through which people were getting genetic testing. So highly prevalent, genetic conditions are around us. They're underdiagnosed. Not surprisingly, many individuals with underlying genetic conditions do not come to medical attention or are uh, misdiagnosed with having a common disorder when it's really a genetic subtype of a disease. And we saw this with FH. And again, these types of findings have been replicated with other diseases. And then not surprisingly, because many of these types of diagnoses are hidden amongst general patient populations, they're not being treated uh, the way they optimally could be treated. And this is showing that even in individuals who had a genotype positive finding for FH, who had high cholesterol, who were on a statin because of their high cholesterol, were still not being managed aggressively enough to meet an LDL threshold that would prevent them from having early onset heart disease, stroke, and peripheral artery disease. So, Prevalent, underdiagnosed, undertreated, those are really themes that have come up time and time again in my work and many others' works looking at genomic screening for unidentified genetic conditions in general patient populations. I will note that this was in a hospital-based population, so how much of this you can extrapolate to the general population, uh, I think we're gonna learn through other efforts such as the All of Us program. Okay, so what do you think about screening for when it comes to population genomic screening? And this is a question that will come up time and time again. Today, um, there is a lively debate about what would be appropriate with many different programs uh, in the research setting uh, utilizing different uh, conditions that they consider appropriate for population genomic screening. But generally, if you think about um, those, uh, the things that I highlighted earlier as being diseases being prevalent, uh, highly penetrant, so the likelihood of someone having manifestations of the disease being higher than the average population, uh, diseases that are relatively underdiagnosed or missed in routine medical care, and then whether they're medically actionable. Is there something in a clinical setting that can be done to either prevent the disease to catch it earlier, to improve morbidity and mortality associated with that disease. Uh, so that's what that medical actionability is. And today the CDC considers tier one conditions, three of which are on the right in the table, to be of highest 
uh, those having the highest evidence for a potential positive impact if they were to be screened for in, uh, in the general public. And those are hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome linked to the genes BRCA1 and 2, Lynch syndrome, another cancer syndrome linked to the four genes, uh, the mismatch repair genes on the right, and familiar hypercholesterolemia, the condition we were just discussing in the earlier slides. And if you were to generally screen the US population for these three conditions, you would identify about four and a half million people in the US with the genotype associated with disease risk for these diseases. Okay, so given that, how have we gone about thinking about expanding the reach of genomic screening to diverse populations? One of the real ways that you can make an impact in genomic medicine is leveraging these EHR-linked biobanks. The example I gave before was a biobank in Pennsylvania, part of the Geisinger Health System, um, which is, I can't see, over here, my code. Now, this is a relatively outdated chart. Now, it's from 2019, as you'll see. Um, but what this map of biobanks is showing, that there are an increasing number of biobanks that are linking genomic data to medical record data. Uh, one of them you're all very familiar with is the All of Us Research Program. And these have you know, started in the late 90s and these are ongoing today. And what's on the y-axis is the percent of non-Europeans that participants in these biobanks. And you can see that over time, we've increased the diversity of biobanks. Um, they're colored by the continent in which the biobanks exist. So it's a bit of a complicated chart, but you get the picture that we started off not having much diversity in some of the earlier biobanks. We have increasing diversity, certainly in US biobanks. And then there are these few, bi few biobanks in East Asian countries that are uh, obviously non-European descent biobanks and represent different populations. But in general, still today, I think uh, everyone here would agree that despite fueling genomic discovery and genomic implementation, these biobanks are still not quite representative of global diversity and, uh, and, and that we have some work to do to get there. Now, I'll point to this little island in the middle. This is the Biome Biobank. And this is the biobank that I was very fortunate to spend a lot of time working with uh, in New York during my time at Mount Sinai. And it's a very interesting biobank because the Mount Sinai Hospital sits uh, on the Upper East Side bordering East Harlem and has an extremely diverse patient population. And the diversity of that population is really represented in the diversity of the Biome Biobank. What's shown over here is uh, communities that are linked together through identity by descent or shared haplotypes, shared recent haplotypes uh, that different communities within the Biome Biobank have. And you can see that is a, it is a very diverse patient population. This is work that's led by Emer Kenny, a renowned population geneticist at Mount Sinai, whom I've had the good fortune of working with for a number of years. And what we did was take a look at uh, the Biome Biobank with its rich diversity and see what happens if you now apply genomic screening to this ancestrally diverse population. And I'll show one example of what this looks like for BRCA1 and 2, one of the most well-characterized genetic conditions, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome that we know about well. We test for relatively routinely in medical genetics and oncology practices. And what you can see is that in about 30,000 exome sequenced individuals in the Biome Biobank, we found a pretty high prevalence of disease associated variants in BRCA1 and 2. About 1 in 140 individuals in Biome were harboring one of those variants. Um, previous estimates of the genotype prevalence for BRCA1 and 2 were 1 in 400. We think the true population prevalence is probably around 1 in 200. It was a bit higher in our biobank because we had certain populations, and you can see the numbers uh, on the right here, uh, there were certain populations that were at relatively higher risk, and I'll point to the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry group where the genotype prevalence was one in 50, and this really well recapitulates what's known about the Ashkenazi Jewish population, which is at higher risk for BRCA1 and 2 because of the presence of three founder variants that we were high, finding at very high frequency in Biome. Those are listed over here. Ooh, where's my pointer? There we go. 
But then in addition to that, we found many other founder variants and New York City is a true melting pot of diversity and uh, we weren't expecting to see so many founder variants. There were over 20 unique founder variants in different populations that they were represented in, including uh, one particularly high frequency variant in BRCA2, which is a known founder variant in individuals of Puerto Rican descent. So very interesting ability to look at uh, genetic ancestry communities within the Biome Biobank and how cancer risk might be present differentially uh, for this specific disorder. And it turns out that the vast majority of people who have a BRCA1 or 2 pathogenic variant today are unaware of that risk that's well established to put you at risk for breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and other cancers. Uh, and in this case, we found 73% of people who did not have uh, evidence of having had any clinical genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2 in their EHRs. Other studies have found very similar uh, proportions of people not having knowledge of this risk. Um, but there's more. So one thing we are good at is identifying, uh, or better at, I should say, is identifying genetic risk for founder populations. In this case, the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, founder population, a uh, founder variants in BRCA1 and 2 are well recognized and well established. And when we looked at those variants in particular, we found that 40% almost of people with Ashkenazi Jewish founder variants in BRCA1 and 2 did have evidence of having had clinical genetic testing in their EHRs prior to this biobank effort. Uh, and so what that meant was that everybody else who did not have an Ashkenazi Jewish founder variant in BRCA1 and 2 did not have that knowledge. So 20% of people with other variants had not ever received clinical genetic testing. And this is a way that trying to use uh, knowledge of populations to decide who should, be, who should be counseled about genetic testing, who should be offered genetic testing, might benefit certain populations, but certainly not all populations. The other thing that we found was that there were high numbers of variants of uncertain significance. These are uh, the types of variants that it's really hard to classify whether they are benign, not disease associated, or pathogenic, disease associated. They sit in this gray zone that's the bane of geneticists' existence because when you're when you have a patient with a variant of uncertain significance, you don't act on that clinically and there's little information that you can give a patient. Uh, and ideally, you're hoping for a reclassification of that variant over time um, that tells you one way or another, is it disease causing? We saw differences in the number of people who had variants of uncertain significance or variants with conflicting evidence of pathogenicity in a well-established clinical database of genetic variants called ClinVar. And those differences were across the population groups in the Biome Biobank. And you could see that people who were self-reported African-American or black had the highest rates of variants of uncertain significance or conflicting variants. Uh, and this was generally true for non-European descent populations compared, or compared to European descent populations. And when we looked a little bit further, we found that actually this increase of variants of uncertain significance or conflicting variants correlated with the increased proportion of continental African genetic ancestry. Uh, and so there's clearly a problem in how we're able to interpret variants uh, in non-European descent populations. And we see this in that data, and we've seen this for other, other variants in different genes as well. Um, and this is where, you know, while we have made advances to increase the diversity of genomic databases and our knowledge, we still have some ways to go. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to sidetrack for a minute because I think it's important to note that this type of lack of knowledge and the lack of our ability to interpret accurately variants in non-European descent populations is not uh, is not specific to genomic screening. And so I just want to give a, a little sidetrack example of how this impacts our ability to do indication-based testing for diagnostic purposes. This is work that uh, was done with uh, through the CSER consortium, the NYC KITSI program, took individuals, uh, pediatric children who were uh, racially and ethically diverse and had a high suspicion of a genetic condition, either had neurologic, cardiac, or immunologic diseases that somebody felt might be genetic. And those children received either whole genome sequencing or a targeted gene panel test appropriate for the phenotype that they presented with. And we were attempting to look at what the diagnostic yield was through whole genome sequencing versus targeted gene panel using this really nice paired approach. 
And overall, the diagnostic yield was 17.5%. But you could see that there were individuals with uncertain results. Uh, those are in green. And what we found that overall was that whole genome sequencing did have a higher diagnostic yield compared to targeted gene panels. And this was great because we were trying to think of is whole genome sequencing an appropriate first-line diagnostic test? But then we looked across our largest population groups. This is by self-report, um, and you can see that on the chart here. So individuals who are black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, or white European American. And what you can see here is that for Hispanic and white pediatric patients, the diagnostic yield for whole genome sequencing was significantly greater than that for targeted gene panels, but that wasn't true for black or African American children enrolled into this study. And we wondered why that was, and we looked at the rates of uncertain clinical interpretations across those same population groups, and we did find that there was a higher degree of uncertain clinical interpretations for variants identified in pediatric children who had a suspicion for a genetic condition, again, underlying the importance of being able to accurately interpret variants in uh, black and African American communities and do better to improve the diagnostic yield and the impact of innovative genomic technology in the frontline clinical care for all patients. So that's my aside on how this, uh, you know, these, these are problems that do perpetuate not just in the genomic screening world, but also in the diagnostic world. We're going to go back to genomic screening. And the big question in the field today is, does genomic screening lead to improved health outcomes? What this means is, we know that genomic screening through many different studies has the ability to, to identify individuals at genetic risk for a disease, it has the ability to identify people who will go on to develop signs and symptoms of disease. But does this help them improve uh, their health outcomes? Does this prevent disease from manifesting? Does it prevent morbidity and mortality? Uh, and so a lot of biobanks have implemented genomic screening prog programs to return results to patients who are research participants in those biobanks to follow them longitudinally and then see if this does impact health outcomes. We did this at Mount Sinai. We started a genomic screening program to identify, confirm research genetic findings to make them clinical, and return medically actionable genomic results for the use in clinical care. And this was a really exciting program um, that is ongoing at Mount Sinai. So going back to which which genes should you screen if you're screening a population for medically actionable results? Again, divergent points of view, many different biobanks doing different things. We can uh, go back to the CDC tier one conditions that I mentioned earlier, which have the highest evidence for potential positive impact if they are screened. Um, this is uh, a, a discussion paper that was published uh, by the National Academy of Medicine that showed a tiered approach to approaching um, genomic screening with tier one genes and conditions being uh, those that are identified as CDC tier one by the CDC themselves. And then how to think about additional genes that one might consider for screening based on the context, based on the expertise, based on the patients or research participants. And again, because this is a really an evolving field, um, the, I do want to point out that the American College of Medical Genetics has recently convened a work group to really think through what are the appropriate conditions and genes to think about screening for in the general population. Uh, and this work group has just launched and is working towards providing some guidance to folks who are trying to do this. Um, so, we decided at Mount Sinai that we were going to screen for those CDC tier one conditions which felt appropriate, and then we added a tier two condition, and that's TTR, uh, the genus TTR, the condition is hereditary TTR amyloidosis that hopefully many of you are familiar here, uh, familiar with here. And what's on the left is uh, an image I like from amyloidosis.org that shows uh, the different organs that hereditary TTR amyloidosis can impact. And so just to briefly describe this condition, this is a condition caused by abnormal deposition of amyloid. It's different from what people think of traditionally as amyloid being linked to things like Alzheimer's disease, different kind of amyloid, really deposits across many, many different organs, as you can see here, and with the primary phenotypes linked to this condition being polyneuropathy that manifests with many different uh, neuropathic signs and symptoms, and also cardiomyopathy and heart failure. 
So why did we decide to screen for HATTR and this, uh, this gene TTR in our population? Well, going back to those different characteristics of genes one might want, might want to consider in a genomic screening program, the prevalence of TTR is relatively high. In fact, the most common variant is TTRV142I, which we found in Biomi and many other studies is present in up to 4% of individuals who self-identify as black or African American, and up to 1% of Hispanic and Latino individuals in New York City. It's an autosomal dominant condition, so that, is, that puts it at a relatively high prevalence, and I would argue makes it not a rare condition. Um, the penetrance is also thought to be relatively high, although there's evolving data because the more we find genetic conditions in the general population, the more we understand that the, the true penetrance may not be what we previously thought. Current thought is that VV142I is associated with about 60% increase of heart failure. That seems to manifest really in, in older individuals after the age of 50 or so. The diagnosis of this condition, because if you think back to the figure I showed before, it's really challenging. Um, some of the signs and symptoms of disease are common. Um, they can be mistaken for any other condition, like GI disturbances, uh, proteinuria, things like that. Uh, and when uh, we looked in Biome at people with heart failure in the biobank, it turned out that only 11% of individuals with heart failure had a diagnosis of TTR, even though they were genotype positive for V142I. So it is relatively underdiagnosed, and it's medically actionable. There are relatively new, I don't think they're that new anymore, but the treatment options exist for um, TTR amyloidosis. And what's really interesting and important is that this is a progressive disease with increased amyloid deposition causing organ damage and failure. And the therapies that are currently approved, they don't reverse amyloidosis when it's already been deposited. They do prevent additional deposition of amyloid. And so what you really want to do is figure out as early as possible when to intervene and prevent that amyloidosis from causing organ damage. Um, so for those reasons, and also a really important reason is that Mount Sinai had expertise in the amyloidosis space, had coalesced a center for amyloidosis where we could really link to um, link patients and research participants who were receiving the results to get care, uh, really led us to think that this was the right place to implement genomic screening for TTR and then study that. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, and I want to point out here that uh, TTR recently was added to the American College of Medical Genetics secondary findings list. This is a list of genes and conditions that are considered to be appropriate to be returned routinely to any person, pediatric or adult, for their different conditions in the list, um, who have obtained exome or genome sequencing for any indication. Um, and so this guidance is really meant to indicate that the conditions on here are medically actionable and there's something that you can do to reduce morbidity and mortality and TTR made that list uh, in 2022. So because this was a relatively new condition, not as well, um, not as well established as the CDC tier one conditions, uh, we were really uh, working to improve genome informed care navigation to ensure that people were not being misdiagnosed. Uh, and I put here uh, very importantly that when you identify a variant that does not equal a diagnosis, it equals the identification of a variant and what risks that that might put you, uh, uh, you, you know, want, make you want to think about. But it's not in itself a diagnosis until there's been a clinical evaluation and follow up. Uh, and so we wanted to ensure that the research participants receiving a TTR result through the genomic screening program were going to have appropriate care and follow-up. So we developed a care navigation pathway. This is an example of a fact sheet. We developed these in both English and translated into Spanish. And, uh, and the patients, participants of the biobank would get these with their results. And we made sure that these were also received by the clinicians who were going to be involved in the care. And this is just an example of what we would do with a person with a finding for TTR. Make sure they were referred appropriately. As I mentioned, we had a multidisciplinary amyloidosis center. Uh, there was primary care that was involved. And uh, with the help of expertise, institutional expertise, we developed a pathway for clinical recommendations for follow-up, for surveillance, and for treatment if appropriate, if the patient were diagnosed. 
So to quickly share what, what do we find when you screen for TTR, some of the early outcomes from the first 30 or so participants who received a result, we did a, a pretty in-depth study to look at those individuals. We had them come in, we took a full family history, we looked at their personal history. None of them had prior knowledge of their HATTR risk. None of them had had clinical genetic testing prior to this, but over half had at least one uh, HATTR related feature at the time of their result disclosure. And that's shown here on the right. Uh, and you can see that four people had, uh, had heart cardiac features present. Uh, and I'll share that you know, all four of those actually had heart failure, uh, but none of them had a diagnosis of TTR amyloidosis. There were people with autonomic neuropathy and peripheral neuropathy. And we, we really collated the different signs and, signs and symptoms of disease and thought about who was manifesting any, uh, any of these related features, and it looked like a high proportion were. So um, what did they do? We looked within eight months of having disclosed results, and uh, over half had followed, followed up with a specialist at that point. Um, of those who'd followed up, a large majority had recommended cardiac studies. Um, and again, we had established this in collaboration with a cardiologist expert at Mount Sinai. And two of the initial cohort did ultimately get a diagnosis of a TTR based on that clinical evaluation of follow-up, uh, which led to modifications in their treatment plans. Okay, so that's genomic screening in a nutshell. A lot of exciting work going on in this field, including in the All of Us program. I do want to spend a couple minutes talking about polygenic risk scores because I'd be remiss not to mention that uh, this is a new way to think, newer way to think about poly, uh, genomic screening. Uh, now for more common diseases, really a lot of the genomic screening uh, pertains to rarer conditions in the cancer, cardiovascular space, and other conditions as well. Uh, but more and more we now realize the importance of polygenic risk scores and their ability to aggregate someone's risk across their genome, taking all these small effect size SNPs from genome-wide association studies, putting them together into a single score that can tell you uh, if you're an individual at the highest risk uh, spectrum and what your likelihood of developing or having that condition in your lifetime might be. And if you look on the right, uh, these are just examples so of common conditions that are related to the diseases that are considered tier one by the CDC, so breast cancer, but you, know, you could also say ovarian cancer, although that's less common. Uh, breast cancer, very common, colorectal cancer, and coronary artery disease. And there are studies that have shown that if you take people at the highest end of the risk spectrum for these conditions, they have equivalent risk for disease as people with monogenic variants in these disease genes. So reason to think that there's potential utility, and I say potential because we have not established yet the clinical utility of polygenic risk scores, but there is potential to use polygenic risk scores uh -oh, there we go, um, to predict risk to develop these common conditions and intervene through lifestyle or risk management interventions to do something similar as what I've described in other genomic screening projects. So one of the things that I'm really excited to continue to be a part of as part of my Mount Sinai role is uh, the Emerge pro program, which is in its fourth cycle and is focused now on bringing genome-informed risk assessments into clinical care. I'm assuming that many people here are very familiar with the Emerge network, um, but for those of you who aren't, the idea is to uh, recruit 25,000 adult and pediatric participants into a study from primary care practices deliver genomic informed risk assessments that are based on polygenic risk scores for the conditions on the right, uh, as well as monogenic diseases for a subset and family history and aggregate all of that information, bring it back to those participants, bring it to their primary care physicians and evaluate outcomes from having done this genome informed risk assessment. We're um, near the end of our recruitment for the Emerge uh, program at Mount Sinai, which is one of the 10 sites and one of the diverse, high diversity sites of the Emerge network. And we're excited to now look at what's going to happen and how are people informing their care management through the delivery and receipt of genome informed risk assessments. One of the things that we did early on in uh, the Emerge um, project was to look at biobank participants and query whether clinical polygenic risk scores would, in fact, prompt risk-reducing behavior in a diverse patient population. 
And what we did is we selected 15 Spanish-speaking and 15 English-speaking ancestrally diverse individuals to participate in a qualitative study where we showed them an informational video about what polygenic risk scores were, what a genome-informed risk assessment was that put all this information together. We told them uh, about polygenic risk scores and some of the potential benefits, some of the potential concerns, which include that um, some of these scores don't perform as well when they've been developed and validated in certain populations and then are ported to other populations. And this is a well-known issue for polygenic risk scores today. Um, and then we asked them, what do they think? And you know, what did, were they interested, were they concerned, et cetera. And some of the highlights um, that I wanted to bring back here was in general, uh, in this study, we found there was high interest in receiving polygenic risk scores, which was great because we were about to launch a big study that was in fact going to deliver polygenic risk scores. There was high perceived utility, which was focused on the potential for personal health benefits, and I'll also add for potential health benefits to families and to communities. And what was very interesting to my team was uh, that there was relatively little concern about this issue of the limited per predictive power of polygenic risk scores in underrepresented populations. Uh, and again, you know, this was an unexpected result, and I think it speaks to the importance of asking the patient population that we want to pilot and implement genomic medicine programs and what their concerns are and, and if they have them. Now, some of the barriers that came up in this study to the uptake of both getting tested, getting polygenic risk scores, this new genomic innovation that we were offering, uh, and then adopting recommendations based on those polygenic risk scores spoke to the potential, potential for health disparities there. Um, some of those concerns were financial and uh, you know, other socioeconomic, socio socioeconomic factors, health insurance status, and how would that play in? And that is a big question today for genomics uh, and genetics in general, race, ethnicity, and preferred language, and whether there would be disparities and uptake there. Uh, and finally, the importance of how you communicate complex genetic information uh, and whether those participants felt they would adequately be able to understand these polygenic risk scores that were being reported back to them. So this was published a couple of years ago now, and um, you know, we tr tried to take learnings from this um, qualitative study to really inform the design and implementation of our eMERGE project in Mount Sinai and across the network. So if you think about what I said earlier, that genomic screening can potentially, we hope, be used to predict and prevent disease and personalized treatment across someone's lifespan, there are certain things that we need to do to ensure that all people will benefit from this technology. And those are to improve our knowledge of genomic variation in diverse populations. Again, we're coming a long way in improving the diversity of genomic databases for our knowledge, um, but we still have room to grow. Uh, we need to pilot genomic screening programs in diverse populations and take into account those populations and uh, use community engagement efforts to really inform implementation uh, and promote health equity and, uh, and learn how to implement genome-informed care in routine clinical practice. This is not a way that we practice medicine today. I think through uh, these pilot genomic screening programs and through studies like eMERGE, we're, we're really tying both a geno genome-informed risk assessment, a result, with a direct recommendation for what to do with that result is really gonna help us inform uh, the path to the future. So this is part, I think one and two, maybe just one. Uh, part one, yes. So I'm going to acknowledge the folks who are mainly at Mount Sinai who have enabled all of this work, and this has mainly been done through the Institute for Genomic Health uh, with uh, Emer Kenny, who's the director of the institute, and folks listed here who have all played a really important role in enabling this type of research through funding from NIH, including NHGRI for eMERGE and for the CSER study, uh, and mostly the biobank participants who, without their voluntary participation in this research effort, uh, this research would not be possible. So that concludes part one, and I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to switch hats to talk about work we're doing now at 23andMe to really scale genomic screening through consumer genetics, and I hope you'll see how some of the same questions we've been trying to answer, and I've been trying to answer uh, in my academic role, are things that we are also working towards in a consumer genetics company. 
So what, what is consumer genetics? I don't know how many people are familiar with 23andMe or this approach, uh, but the idea is that uh, there is a way for consumers to obtain their own genetic testing out of interest, out of variety of reasons, uh, and this enables folks to order a kit on their own. A saliva sample collection gets sent to their home, they spit into a tube, send it back within a few weeks, get a host of different genetic reports pertaining to ancestry, health, traits, all kinds of things. Uh, and just to give you a few highlights about 23andMe today, um, I should actually update this. We're at now 15 million uh, genotyped customers in our database. We have really high consent to research, so every person who uh, is part of 23andMe is offered the opportunity to participate in research, and we get about 80% individuals who opt to participate in research. Uh, and then we deploy surveys to collect self-reported information on a variety of different things, a lot of health-related information and others. Uh, we have more than four billion survey questions who've been answered and people come back. And if you are a 23andMe customer, you come back and you, uh, you might get an answer, get a, get a survey question and respond to it. Uh, and we find that there's really high engagement, up to 70% of customers are coming back every 90 days or so. And there's a strong uh, research component to 23andMe that's leveraging the enormity of this database and the genotypes and phenotypes that are included in it. Uh, and that was backwards. <laughs> this, is, this is just a snapshot. Uh, we do have a publication space, so anyone who's interested, I don't know uh, if it's completely up to date, but you can look at 23andMe.com publications. There are over 230 publications, many of which have been in collaboration with academia, uh, other industry partners, and nonprofit organizations. What I'm showing on the right is something that um, I thought was a really interesting way to engage with people who are participating voluntarily in research. And I don't know if we do enough of this in biobank efforts uh, in general. But what uh, 23andMe does is tell the person, the customer, the participant, what research they have, their data has been included in. Uh, and this is my personalized publication page, and what it's showing is that I, Nora, have contributed to 40 published discoveries, and then it shows me the different papers that uh, my data has contributed to, which I think is a really nice way to show people how their um, data is, is enabling scientific uh, advances. So I want to just talk about uh, one of the things that we're doing that does relate to everything we talked about here, genomic screening and its potential impact. and what we've been doing at 23andMe with 15 million people having received genetic information, not everyone is getting health-related genetic information, but a lot of people are. And within health-related genetic information includes a subset of conditions and genes that are considered today uh, by existing guidelines to be medically actionable. And this is showing research consented, the number of research consented customers who have a pathogenic variant in one of the genes listed here, so BRCA1 and 2 and TTR we've talked about. Uh, this is HFE linked to hereditary hemochromatosis, LDLR and APOB linked to familiar hypercholesterolemia we also talked about, MUYH, which is another cancer gene, um, that condition is recessive, so we have almost 300 people who have a two MUYH variant. Uh, and in general, you can see there are thousands of people who have received a medically actionable health-related genetic report and who are research consented and for this study who had viewed that report at least a month before we deployed a survey to ask what happened uh, with, that, with the result that they received. And what, one of the things that we're trying to understand is what do people do after receiving this kind of information? Do they, uh, do they share it? What next steps do they take? So I'll walk you through some of our findings from this. Uh, one of the findings that is consistent with what we've seen in biobank research and academic settings is that the vast majority of people with these medically actionable conditions had not had prior clinical genetic testing. So this was the first time they were learning about the presence of this genetic risk. Uh, only 19% overall had had a genetic test beforehand, and you can see that number is a bit higher for BRCA1 and 2. Not surprisingly, that's one of the things that we do test for more routinely in clinical care. Most individuals had a personal and or a family history of disease, and here we asked questions that were really specific to each of the conditions that we were including in this study. Uh, and you can see that over 50% on, on, in both sides either had a family history and or a, or a personal history of, uh, of the disease. And you can see this was highest in individuals with uh, genotype 
uh, positive FH. And for the family history, there was a high percentage of individuals with a uh, linked cancer and associated cancer of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome in at least one biological relative. So then we wanted to know our participants who are getting this information through a direct-to-consumer genetic testing approach, sharing those results. And we asked whether they were sharing results with a primary care physician or a specialist that they saw. And that's on the left. And you can see almost 50% were sharing. And that number was higher, again, for BRCA1 and 2. Not surprisingly, people recognize the importance of the BRCA genes as our well-known uh, and are more likely to share those with a physician uh, or a clinical specialist. Um, but this number is not where we need it to be, where we feel like those are medically actionable results that all should be getting shared with a healthcare professional. And this is an area that we're really trying to approach and make sure that we are ensuring benefit that comes from receiving these results. And if you look on the right, almost three quarters of individuals share their genetic results with their family members. And this is really interesting. Uh, there's an opportunity here to expand the reach of genetic testing through something called cascade testing. When one individual is identified, that means you've also identified risk for their biological relatives with a 50% increased risk for every uh, first degree relative. And, and that enables uh, really increased knowledge in families. We see that there is a lot of sharing uh, and, and actually more sharing with relatives than there when we saw with healthcare professionals. So what happens when a participant has now shared those results with a healthcare professional? This is an example going back to familial hypercholesterolemia. So we, found, we asked, did those participants receive recommendations from their healthcare professional based on those genetic results? And we focused these recommendations on things that were pertaining to risk for FH. Did they get a lipid test? Were they started on a cholesterol-lowering medication? Or did they have a medication changed, modified, added? Uh, did they have any other cardiac testing, for example? And there were multiple healthcare professional recommendations that were made, as you can see here. And what was really interesting was that participant adherence or uptake to those recommendations when they were made by their trusted healthcare provider was very high, which indicates that there is huge potential to bring consumer genetic information into healthcare appropriately and ensure that ultimately healthcare professional recommendations are, uh, are leading to changes that are necessary to reduce risk. So, these are, this is our first study looking at medically actionable conditions. We hope to do much more to understand the outcomes from receiving uh, health-related genetic information through consumer genetic testing. But we do have an indication that we can identify genetic risk in individuals with previously unknown risks for diseases that are considered to be actionable. Uh, we find that many of those conditions, are, many of those individuals have a personal or family history of disease indicating that we may be missing opportunities in traditional healthcare to identify those with true risks and uh, offer them genetic testing in a, in a more established clinical setting. Uh, and you know what I find really encouraging is this, this concept that participants uh, may have high uptake of recommendations when they are being made by a healthcare professional who has viewed their results and is using, using that to inform their decision making. So on that final piece, with healthcare professional involvement to inform care, how do we go from increasing access, which arguably uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing has done, to now ensuring benefit, ensuring that healthcare provision is made in the right way, following the receipt of genetic results from research, from direct-to-consumer testing, from anywhere? Um, well, one of the things I always like to point out, I am a medical geneticist, my background, and there's just not enough medical geneticists to keep up with the demand for genomic medicine in today's world where there's more and more genetic information available um, through amazing efforts like the All of Us Research Program, through direct-to-consumer genetic testing, through biobanks, and through the uptake of genetic testing in routine clinical care today. Um, I, I always find this really striking. I'm not sure if it's exactly true today. This is from a couple years ago, but four clinical geneticists per one million individuals, the vast majority of whom are located in just five states. Uh, and there are few with like very few, there are a few states with few certified clinical geneticists. And at least at the time that this was published, Wyoming had none. I don't know if that's still the case now, but hopefully someone here does. Um, and the issue is that other healthcare professionals who are not medical geneticists have simply not been trained adequately to feel comfortable using genetic information to uh, manage clinical decision making. 
Um, there are currently no requirements for non-genetics professionals to have specific knowledge or competencies in genomics, and there are very few guidelines uh, established for non-genetics healthcare professionals. And as someone reminded me today, with all the advances, advances we've seen in genetic testing, there are actually few guidelines even for people who have been trained in genetics today. So um, there are things we can do to expand knowledge of genetics in the non-genetics healthcare workforce. Um, going back to Mount Sinai, one of the things that I did in my time there uh, four years ago now was to launch a track that is specific to internal medicine residents, so uh, residents who are going to go on to be generalists or specialists in adult subspecialties uh, who are interested in learning more about genomics and how to apply that into clinical care into whatever specialty they go into. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, include a genetics and genomics 101 curriculum for all interns. So everyone who starts their internal medicine residency at Mount Sinai in their first year gets a genetics 101. Uh, these are the basics. If they're interested, they can apply into the genomic medicine track and then they complete this track and really are feeling much more comfortable, hopefully, after doing this to bring genetics into how they practice medicine. So that's one thing that uh, was really exciting that, uh, that is still ongoing at Mount Sinai. I left it in good hands. Uh, and then going back to 23andMe, one of the things that we have done to ensure that consumers who are getting genetic related, uh, health-related genetic information have a place to go where clinicians have been trained to use genetics to inform clinical decision making. And this is through a telemedicine platform that was acquired by 23andMe several years ago. Uh, and there are primary care physicians and nurse practitioners who are delivering uh, clinical care services through that platform. And my team developed uh, an educational curriculum that leverages microlearning through very short osmosis-based uh, videos. Um, Experiential learning, so those PCPs are uh, offered the opportunity to get direct to consumer genetic testing themselves, which allows them to really explore all the different uh, types of genetic results that they may see in their day to day. Uh, this is entirely optional, of course. Uh, and it uses a flipped classroom um, uh, model so that it's really leveraging what's known to work well for adults who are learning something new. Uh, this is led by Ann Greb, who is a fantastic educator who led a program for masters, uh, for genetic counseling master's degree uh, before joining 23andMe. And clinicians who are going through this, they start off being relatively unfamiliar with direct-to-consumer genetic testing. And 53% are unfamiliar with genetic concepts altogether. And you can see that when we pilot this in um, over 40 clinicians, at the end and across time, their comfort and confidence with understanding and using genetic information increased. Uh, and we hope to be able to scale this and implement this more broadly to really help to uh, bring genetics and genomic knowledge to healthcare prof professionals outside of this ecosystem too. Okay, so. I think I'm gonna stop very soon. I'm going back to some of these key takeaways and now I've just added one more, but I'm gonna repeat them all. So genomic medicine, huge potential to, I think, really scale how we think about risk prediction. And this isn't a new concept. We think about risk factors in medicine all the time. And genetics has its place in that. We just quite haven't gotten there yet. And if we want this to be a mechanism to understand disease risks in all people and do something to prevent those risks once we've identified them, we need to, again, improve our knowledge of how genomic variation impacts humans across our global diversity. We need to, again, pilot genomic screening programs that are focused on the different populations, the different expertise, the different context of patients and research participants across different settings and learn from those. And I think there's a lot of really exciting work happening in that realm. Um, to in implement genome-informed care in routine clinical practice, I didn't have time to go through what that means other than to show genome-informed care navigation. Really, it requires the development of clinical support resources, point-of-care tools, clinical decision support, EMR integration, all of the things that are going to facilitate already overburdened primary care physicians and other colleagues uh, who need to really have the resources and support to integrate genetic information and in how they think about their patients. Uh, and education, so this last piece, how do we really scale the education in genomic medicine across specialties uh, in, in all areas of medicine? 
So with that, uh, acknowledgments part two are to my 23andMe colleagues. Uh, I lead the genomic health team, uh, which really consists of a, an amazing group of genetic counselors, physicians, public health experts, and now clinical uh, researchers and PhD scientists who are informing the development of our health-related genetic reports. Uh, and we have a huge research department that's led by uh, Joyce Tong, and that team has really been instrumental in maintaining a database of genotype, phenotype information, all the consenting and IRB protocols that go along with that, uh, and you know, the, the use of that data for research. And finally, all of the people who uh, decide to participate in research through 23andMe are enabling these advances as well. I thank you all for listening, and uh, I think we have time for questions. That was wonderful, Nora. Thank you so much. Um, and we do have time for questions. Uh, there are uh, microphones on either side. And we'll, we also have some uh, coming in online. Uh, so you get the privilege of the first question, please. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for a great talk. My question was about some of the surveys of follow-up behaviors for those people who got results through 23andMe. Because obviously, when people will actually show, you know, the 46% who will share it with their healthcare provider, whoever that may be, they will follow up on those recommendations. But do you guys have any data or any surveys on those people who don't share and who don't follow up, or even those who maybe haven't opened their reports or anything else? Are you guys providing any like nudges or any data on kind of what was the barrier to not follow up on those things? Yes, I love that question. Thank you. Um, we are we are exploring those things, uh, and one of the one of the questions you brought up is, do we have knowledge of who's opening their reports? And um, that's an area that's of particular interest to me when I know that we have genetic variants in uh, certain genes that are disproportionately impacting diverse populations. And so one of the questions that we recently asked was, is there you know, are there discrepancies? Do we see uh, differential rates of report opening? Uh, and there are some examples, this is you know, very preliminary, that we're looking into that. And where we're identifying areas that could use improvement, we're piloting this year new ways to exactly what you said, nudge people to increase their awareness of potentially medically impactful information that they might have in their reports. So stay tuned, more to come on that. It is an area of, of interest and importance to us. <laughs> Thanks. I actually had a follow-up question of that, which is, um, so obviously 23andMe people, they are somewhat motivated if they've actually gone through the trouble of doing all of this. Do you see that the sort of follow-ups and so on that you had uh, evaluated through that questionnaire, is that gonna look similar to the the eMERGE folks or the Biome folks, um, or have you looked at that at all or planned to? Uh, we have not looked at that yet. Um, you know, one ex the, I think the knowledge of like who has had clinical genetic testing previously matches really well with what we've seen in very different settings, you know, in hospital-based biobanks. Um, so that, that feels pretty consistent. In terms of data sharing, um, I think we can look and see what, is, what are rates of sharing of genetic information uh, with family members through other efforts. We haven't done it yet, but it's something that we can definitely look at. Um, and I think it's going to be really important to look at you know, the diversity of participants and all these different efforts because they speak to different populations in different contexts. So absolutely, like, we need to understand that even within our own study are there different demographic characteristics among people who do share versus not? So those are things we're starting to look at. Wonderful. Mary. Oh, excellent talk. I had a quick question. So you were uh, mostly talking about um, medically actionable um, uh, variants for the individual who receives the information. Um, and I was wondering about like recessive carriers um, where the information might not be actionable for them, but could inform like future reproductive decisions. Um, are you looking into uh, reporting of that sort of information? Um, so for 23andMe work, do you mean? Yes. So we do um, have a number of carrier status reports that people do get um, through their 23andMe uh, services. One of the things that we've looked at because you're right, there's no immediate medical actionability for that person necessarily. Although, you know, as we, I think, were we discussing this previously? Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to find more and more that heterozygous state might, might mean different things for different people. 
Um, one of the things that we've looked at is how does it change our knowledge of who should be offered carrier testing? And one of the things that we um, still see today is population-based testing approaches. Uh, for example, using um, the Ashkenazi Jew Jewish population may get recommendations for a carrier screening that are different. Um, then other populations, and that's true for, for you, other populations where there's well, uh, more, uh, more knowledge about increased risk for certain recessive conditions. And you know, again, we find that when you use that type of approach and it's not an equivalent approach across all people, you tend to miss opportunities to really inform an equitable approach to testing. Um, so that's one of the things that we've done in the carrier space. We haven't looked at um, actionability the way that I've been describing it here for screening and prevention, but certainly things that we can think of. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Uh, just before in the room, any, any online questions? Good, so uh, Peter. <clears throat> Nora, that was great. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so when I think about personalized medicine, um, and is, is that the word that we're still currently using these days? Just because, you depends know, things- Depends on you ask. <laughs> depends on you ask, okay. So I'm still gonna use it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think back to, you know, even within my own field, you know, Archibald Garrod, right back in the early 19th century, introduced this idea of, of biochemical individuality, right? That we all have these unique aspects of ourselves which um, lead to disease um, susceptibility. What, so, so based on that, in terms of personalized medicine, what do you see as kind of the future in terms of what type of omic information are we going to be integrating you know, um, besides, you know, the nuclear genome, the mitochondrial genome, are we going to be integrating metabolomics, mm -hmm. RNA-seq, you know, things like that to get a real full picture of an individual's susceptibilities? Yeah, it's, it's something that I, I think um, many folks are thinking about. Um, what I, you know, love about genetics is understanding your, you know, your map for your lifetime ahead of you, and that germline risk is really informative for, but again, for your lifetime. Um, and then if I have someone who's in front of me who's age 30, I would love to be able to tell them this is where you're at today um, based on other omics and other, you know, other lab tests, other imaging, other, other types of data that we want to tell you about your current health status. Um, so use that germline DNA to inform your health opportunities so that we're not just talking about disease risks and, and then really figure out what's going to be best poised to inform about current status, and then you know, probably that's a test that you're repeating over time. Uh, proteomics has really interesting potential. There was great data last year on how you could potentially think about cardiovascular disease and how proteomics can, can inform very early onset cardiovascular disease. Um, pretty expensive technology today to think about widespread applications. Metabolomics, really interesting. Uh, I think there's not gonna be a single answer, uh, but multi-omics, and I know NIH is really thinking about how to expand that multi-omic universe is very much uh, going to be our future. NIPT, the other one, right, with um, uh, the ability to detect early cancers uh, through, um, through those approaches. Thanks, sorry, just one quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Can you also just comment on uh, somatic um, yes. you know, mutations as well, or sorry, sorry, somatic variants as well? Do you see that also fitting along kind of your, your view of, of, of sampling people or looking at people at multiple times through their life? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, you know, there, again, like I, if you think about in the cancer space um, with the new technologies for early cancer detection, uh, and then, and then what, right? When, in, I think in oncology, we've come a great, a long way in using genomic profiling for tumor cells. More and more now, applying that somatic and germline testing uh, simultaneously to really understand, um, you know, how how those are influencing each other. Um, so, I, again, this is like this is a huge space. I think there, we were talking about this earlier. There's so much room for everyone to be involved in different aspects of it. Um, I don't do as much on the somatic cancer side, but I'm, I'm thinking of non-cancer. Yeah, yeah, for non-cancer, yeah. for sure, same, same. Somatic variants of non-cancer. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting potential there too, agree. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the great presentation. Um, and my first question is uh, kind of on the basic level. When you know someone spits in the tube and sends it back, uh, what kind of tests are we talking about? Are we talking about sequencing or like oh, good, chips yeah. or whatever? So the, 
shall I answer that first? Um, yeah. The the um, the twenty three me product that you are probably most familiar with is a genotyping based product. Uh, so array based genotyping. Okay. Uh, we did launch soft launch recently a sequencing based product uh, based on a clinical exome, uh, okay. but that's that's a little bit different. That's really meant to offer a broader screening approach to people interested in getting sequencing. Yeah, but the most, you. the majority, so what I've showed here with the 15 million individuals, those are um, genotyped individuals, and when we look at medically actionable results, there are selected variants in those genes that they have come back with a result for. Okay, and then is that followed then with like imputation to try to like, you know, get at more positions where there may be expected variants? Um, you know, in some, in some cases, yes. Um, Yes, <laughs> in, some, okay. in some cases, yes. Uh, for, yeah. for the medically actionable, it's a bit complicated landscape, but for the genetic health risk reports, which are the ones that I highlighted today, those are, um, those are reports that have gone to, through the FDA process that are looking at very specific variants and uh, with very high accuracy and, um, and analytic validity. Uh, but you know, on the research side, there's a lot of additional research that can be done with imputed variants, for sure. Sure, thank you. I, I'm asking just because I'm curious if there's plans to, in the future, to incorporate things like uh, the new CHM13 reference genome, where we, you know, have eight percent more of the genome that could potentially be pulled from. To say nothing of the like human pan genome, where yeah. we can have a lot greater diversity represented in the various haplotypes. Yeah, great questions. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're always looking at how to improve what. What, what, what's offered back to consumers. I would think of that differently as like what, what happens on the research end yeah. and what's part of the um, product that's reported back to consumers, um, which you know is very cautious, conservative, strict and accurate, right? Yeah. Um, but certainly there's tons of opportunities to, uh, to bring in new anything that's new knowledge on the research side. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and then the last question for today. Thank you for a great talk. As being in an internal medicine background, um, what's the best age for doing this consumer test? Oh, well, um, 23B is meant for adults. Um, I, think, I think you would get different answers depending on who you ask. It's a very, um, it's an interesting landscape today about how people are thinking about genomic screening, including, this is not something I talked about today, but including in newborns. And there's really interesting work happening to put genomic screening alongside what we think about newborn, newborn screening today, which is not genetics or genomics based. Um, and really, I think, informative work coming out of that through uh, the Guardian study, for example. And the reason I bring that up is that we have a tendency to dichotomize you know, the newborn to the pediatric, and then you, know, you turn 18 or 21 or whatever it is, and all of a sudden, there's something different about you. I, I don't know that that's going to be our future in genomics. I mean, we really, this is really a, a continuum of age. And if you can see the benefit of genomic information for certain reasons, at the newborn stage, or even prenatally, uh, when people are starting to really think about genetics um, for preconception testing, for carrier screening, uh, then you could imagine that that landscape might change tremendously. But you know, for today, the way I've been thinking about medical actionability is mostly for adult onset conditions, which is what I show data on, uh, both in the research biobank setting and within 23andMe, which is focused on the adult consumer. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, we are at the end of our time. Um, so I just want to thank again our wonderful speaker for an incredibly good talk. Um, and if you are able to and need to sort of ask an extra question, we have a couple of minutes extra. But otherwise, thank you very much, and thank you very much to everybody for showing up.